Yes, it is. Thanks for joining us on 2 News Live. I'm Brian Schneid. It's Thursday, winding down the month, month of March here, the 28th. Uh, we're going in depth tonight. Once again, the Ruby Frankie Jody Hildebrand case because there's so much to talk about and so much to look through. I want to share it with you as we go in depth tonight. I encourage you to weigh in on the show. Please go on that YouTube channel or that Facebook Live and type in your comments there. A lot of you, when you're going through a lot of these Frankie Hildebrandt videos that we've put out, uh, which feels like hundreds over the last few months, you have been weighing in with your comments. I'd encourage you to do that again here on 2 News Live tonight. Let's go in depth once again on Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. There is so much body camera video and audio recordings. Before we get to some of these more unique parts of the case involving people other than Ruby and Jody, Here's what happened that day when officers knocked on Jody's door. Open the door! Jody, I need you to step uh, out. I have, I have my turn. That's great. Step out of the house. No, I'm not going to step out of the house. Step out of the house. Step out of the house. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're just going to see. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is there anybody else home? Wait a minute. How do you come to my house? Right there. Look, they come into my house. So have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. So then they go inside of the home. They need a warrant for the safe room, but they search the home for children, initially believing there were two inside. They only found one. Ruby said a 12 year old male showed up with tape around his leg Thursday asking for help, said he was afraid asking for police. How different was this call for you that day? It was a first. Um, I had never been on any sort of a call like that before. On August 30th, 2023, Maddie Ickes was an EMT in paramedic school. There was a lot more depth to the call than kind of what I had imagined. She responded to a 911 call for help. The child looks very emaciated. Maddie was one of the first to see Ruby's son, R. To see him be, to appear so okay, was like a punch to the face. Fire Captain Devin Hill. We unbuttoned his shirt to check and see for any other injuries after we'd cut the bandages off his wrists and ankles. Um, that we realized, I mean, he was, he was very skinny. Both Ickes and Hill left the scene after R was taken to the hospital. And then we got called back a couple hours later um, after they made it into the home and found the, the younger sister. Hey, you okay? So it's just you in here? Police found E in a closet. Sergeant Nick Tobler sat with her for more than three hours, but she refused to walk out. Maddie furthered the trust built by Sergeant Tobler. Are you scared? I think I started out by just, you know, am, am I making you afraid? You know, do you want me to, just trying to, to bridge that connection and really make it apparent that I wasn't a threat to her. And the two EMTs walked her out. I've also, pondered if whether or not I was the right person to be in there that day. Um, a lot of this trauma that these kids have is with women. You still think about her? Absolutely, for sure. We spoke with them on Monday. Now, before we move on to other early suspects in this case, there was a part of my conversation with Sergeant Nick Tobler of Santa Clara Ivins Police that really sticks with me since we spoke earlier this week. Sergeant Tobler is a dad. He also patrols the community. Listen. Throughout the process, we found out that he had escaped at one point. Um, the, the, or the boy that showed up at the house, he had escaped earlier on. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to think. I work patrol. I work, I work the streets with a few other officers. And we're out there working nights, days. And to, be, to know that this guy could have possibly been walking down my street, you know, and I, I wasn't there to... to to help him and stop this abuse from ever taking place. You know, it's, it's hard to not personalize that. And so, you know, yeah, so now my routine's a little different when I, when I go out in the neighborhood. I'm looking for different things. I'm paying attention to different things, um, trying to find avenues that maybe I can stop this from happening to other kids or other people. So yeah, it definitely changed my perspective on how I do police work change my perspective as a father. So let's move on to a part of this case we have not talked about very much over the last week here on 2 News Live. Ruby's husband, Kevin Frankie. Now, Kevin came to the police department in Ivins that day, and officers spoke with him for nearly 30 minutes. After questioning him, they told him what they found with his two youngest children. 
Are you aware of the physical condition of your children? No. No, I'm, I've chosen to trust my wife with the children. That was part of the agreement of our separation. Is that you allow her to physically provide for the needs of the child and just removed from that? I mean, you pay support. I know this is personal questions, but... No, yes, my job is to financially provide for the I was trying to figure out like, how, how much of a role do you play in the caretaking of specifically of, of those two kids? I I pay the bills. Okay. A 12 to 13 year old boy was knocking on doors in a neighborhood asking for food and water. That he was severely emaciated. That he had. What is emaciated? Mean? Skinny, scrawny, uh, malnutritioned, not enough food, not enough water to sustain life. So he had. I'm sorry, what? He had duct tape on his extremities on his hands, on his ankles, and those were covering rope burns that were used to tie him down. Take a second and think about what I just said. That's the condition of your son. Given that information, your son was taken to the hospital. A warrant has been applied and granted by the Department of Child and Family Services to remove both from your wife's care. So no one right now is going to have access to these two children based on their physical condition. Do you understand that? I understand. Do you, would you condone that behavior? But I condone that behavior. Um, That's my job. My job is to find out your knowledge of the treatment of these these based precious on children. No, but again, I don't know the details, or I don't know what's going on. But as you describe that, that sounds horrible, horrible, disgusting. So what you didn't hear was the disbelief, or maybe you could hear it at least in one of the officers' voices who was in that room who initially had a hard time believing that Kevin didn't know a thing about any of the abuse. And that went on for about eight minutes before the clip you just heard. I spoke with the detective on this case earlier this week and asked her about Kevin's involvement. Did you believe that there was a lot of sincerity to how he reacted that day when you were talking with him? Yeah, so initially a father to the kids, you would believe that they have some knowledge, some extent and in that initial interview with him he was very supportive of ruby which was a little alarming based on based on the injuries to the kids that we believed ruby had inflicted so it was very alarming but through our interview with him he really like reiterated he had no contact for over a year and with no contact for over a year and then the emotions he was showing to us and to when DCFS took the kids into state custody, he he appeared to be heartbroken from my point of view. And so, and especially following the second interview it was a complete 180 and he was very forthcoming with us. But after the first interview alone, we, we didn't have enough to even count him as a suspect at that time. So before we move forward, Kevin said that he spoke to Ruby about four times prior to August in the year of 2023. Those were all done by phone calls. He said prior to that day of the arrest and everything went down, he had spoken to her about maybe a month before and he didn't know about this. That's what he said in that interview. He also mentioned he hadn't lived in that home for over a year. He hadn't seen any of his children in about that time frame. So they quickly ruled out Kevin as a suspect. But what about the third member? of Connections Classroom. Remember that is the business involving Ruby Frankie, Jody Hildebrandt, and Pam Botcher? They are trying to figure out why, why, I picked her why up. you picked her up, what you know with her, is she okay?
is, is she did she come here willingly? The, I'll explain. To what are you guys doing? I've explained this already. I'm being as courteous as I can. Okay, okay. well, I'm gonna call an attorney. That's fine. I don't know what's. Yeah, going I don't on. even know what this is all about. Okay, so I'm gonna explain to you when we get to the car. Something. Yes, I just explained to you that you're being detained right now. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you to my car. Okay, I need this officer to stay with your husband, and I'm gonna explain everything to you when we okay. get there. Okay. Yeah. So these videos also from August 30th from American Fork, Utah with Pam Botcher, who was detained. What's the situation here? Well, that's where two of Ruby Frankie's middle children were found. So a lot of people think, what did Pam know? Is she a suspect? Watch these videos right now on our YouTube channel. They have over a million views on them. If you haven't seen them and you're curious, you can watch them on our channel right now in the eight passengers playlist. Ruby's two middle children were found there at Botcher's home that day. Again, that was an American Fork, so note the difference in location between Ivan's Utah and American Fork. By the way, that had to be relayed to local police in Utah County, and they definitely were a little bit confused about the circumstances here nonetheless. People who have followed this case have been very speculative of Pam's involvement. When I spoke with Jesse Hildebrandt, who's Jody's niece, months ago, I asked them about Pam. Jesse told me that Pam was always around Jody's house. That was when Jesse lived in Utah County before Jody moved south. So I also asked Detective Jessica Bate about Pam Botcher as a suspect and what they found when looking into her. We were trying to draw a connection to Pam and her involvement in this, any knowledge of the child abuse and going through the phones. We weren't able to find anything to tie her to being in the home to know of this. Uh, kind of abuse. We knew that the kids had been down here since May and we didn't have anything to tie that she had been down here. We didn't have anything to tie that she had been in the home, that she knew about the injuries. She primarily was around the two middle kids, A and J, and um, so initially suspect, yes, but further into investigation that was kind of dismissed. So they ruled out Kevin Frankie and Pam Botcher as suspects or having any knowledge of the abuse for those two children in Ivan's Utah that were found on August 30th. And as we worked through this case in our investigation, people began coming forward about their past experiences with Jody Hildebrandt. One of them who has firsthand experience with her is Adam Steed. You probably heard from him here on this program and in other programs that have talked about this case. Now, Jody shared Adam's personal information and confidential discussions with church leaders and people who worked at BYU, ultimately, which resulted in her license suspension years ago. Jody Hildebrandt is a monster. I mean, she's sitting there acting like she cares and loves those kids. And in my head, I was the guy that confided with her as a therapist that I had been a victim of sexual abuse and my biggest fear was that someone would think I was a, a predator. I told her that because that's what victims think when they're kids and stuff in Idaho and everyone's and when she got the chance she accused me of being a predator. With your personal experience in this uh, what do you hope others take away from from seeing this consuming the coverage? Well there's tons of victims in the fourth district court. The court had a racket with Jody Hildebrandt and several of their judges and they, they they know her very well and they've condemned a lot of fathers. There's a lot of children out there that you think your parents were sexual predators because of Jody Hildebrandt. And they're not. They're not and you got your families need to heal and you need to come to the truth. That was when we spoke with Adam after sentencing in February. So if we were hearing from people who had these experiences with Jody at KUTV2 News, what did police hear that were investigating this case? I asked Detective Bate about other victims of Jody Hildebrandt's and what they did with that information as people came forward. While the kids were in the hospital and we're waiting to do interviews, we're waiting until they're healthy to do interviews, we just, the calls were flooding in of, I was a victim of Jody, I was a victim of Jody, so I was just following up with all of these potential character witnesses and, you know, there were a few that you kind of sift through and it's not pertaining to the case or doesn't seem pertinent at all, but then there were a few that I'm like, wow, like a lot of what you're saying 
coincides with our victims now. And so those were the victims that I really followed up with and got a good story from them and just understanding what they went through. Um, I would say just mitigating and seeing like what information you need. As far as a lot of those victims, they're beyond the statute of limitations or they're not in my area, I can't do anything with that except tell them to report to their local agency. How many do you think you actually had conversations with or had to take down information from as a credible character witness or, or victim that I'd matched up with some of the, the same behaviors? Yeah, I'd say I spoke with about four that were, I saw consistencies to our story.